But we've been in the book of Galatians chapter 3. And I know at least some of you say, Ah, don't we know it. But what we're looking at here in the end of Galatians chapter 3, we're quickly, quickly coming to the end of this chapter, is the relationship between what we understand from the Scriptures to be salvation by faith alone on one side, and how salvation by faith alone, the promise that God made to Abraham that men would be justified by simple faith, how that relates to the law of Moses, this Mosaic law, these Ten Commandments. You ask 90% of people in America, how am I saved? And if they have any notion of God at all, the unsaved will say, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. You have to keep the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses. And Paul here in the book of Galatians, to the, this letter to these churches in Galatia is saying that's absolutely false. Never was meant to be that way. Uh, faith has always been the way of salvation since the beginning of time. And uh, it always will be the way of salvation for men until we enter the eternal state. By faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, that's the way men have always been saved and the law had nothing to do with it. So we're going through these things. I show them to you quickly if this thing works. And it doesn't. We're looking at the relationship between faith alone in Jesus Christ and the law. And Paul goes through four arguments here. The number one argument we've seen, the law cannot change the promise. The promise is that men will be justified by simple faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. It was faith only. It wasn't the works of Abraham, it was faith. And the Mosaic law, which came 430 years after Abraham didn't change the fact that men are saved by faith, by simple faith. The law cannot change the promise. The law is not greater than the promise. We saw that in Galatians 3, verse 19 to 20. We saw last week the law is not contrary to the promise. The Mosaic law didn't come along and, and, uh, and is in opposition. It's not in opposition to the promise to Abraham that men would be justified by simple faith. That one day the seed would come through Abraham's flesh. One day a Jew would come to earth and save mankind. That promise was not abrogated by the law of Moses. The law of Moses had an entirely different purpose. Had nothing to do with salvation of men's souls. Abraham was saved by faith, and so is everyone else that we'll see in heaven one day. Saved by faith. Whether they came before Jesus Christ or they came in, in human existence after Christ. Faith alone in the Redeemer and faith alone as we look back to the person of Jesus Christ is the only way any man will ever be in heaven. Jesus Himself says that no man, the people that aren't in heaven are only there because they have not believed in the only Son of God for no other reason. And the, what we're going to look at today is the law cannot do, or we'll look at like next time, I'm sorry, we're still in this contrary to the promise section. Next time we'll look at the fact in, in Galatians 3.27 that the Mosaic law cannot do what the promise can do. It can't save. There's nothing in the Mosaic law. Listen, 613 laws. You start it in Exodus, go through the book of Leviticus, you see it sprinkled through a three books of the Bible. There's nothing in the law of Moses in 613 commands that says, believe in this and be saved, or do this and be saved. That verbiage is not in the Mosaic law. It's not in the Mosaic law because that's not the purpose of the law. So there's nothing in the law that's contrary to the promise of God. So in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, this is what we covered last time. It says, is the law then contrary? We're still in this section of is the law in opposition to the promise of, uh, of free grace salvation, believe and be saved. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God, the promises that God made to Abraham? And Paul says, may it never be. Of course not. Banish the thought. But the Scripture, and we saw this last time, and I can't cover this, but the Scripture, the Old Testament, the law, has shut up everyone under sin. It's trapped everyone in their sinfulness and shown them that there's no way out but to rely on a provision of God 
There's no way out of our sinfulness. Man can't elevate himself out of the sinful condition that the law proves that he's under. The Scripture has shut up everyone or trapped everyone or confined everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. See, he goes from what the law couldn't do to what, the faith, what faith in Christ does. It saves. The law is not contrary to the promise of faith in Jesus Christ, promise in the Redeemer. So the Scripture, the Old Testament law had a purpose. And what Paul is picking on here is the one purpose Paul is outlining because it had many different purposes. But what Paul is highlighting here in context is that you people are being told you can be saved in another way by adding the law, the Mosaic law to faith, and I'm telling you that's false. That's what he's talking about here, and that's why he keeps on and on and on talking about the relationship between the law, which is what the Judaizers are trying to teach the Galatian churches, keep the law, and Paul is saying, no, faith in Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. Faith in Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. So the Old Testament proves that everyone is under sin. It traps everyone under sin. The Mosaic Law does. So that the promise, and what's the promise? Faith in Jesus Christ is salvific. So that the promise by faith in Christ might be given to those who simply believe. Who don't work to keep the law but simply believe. Paul is asking this question, is the law against or opposed to the promise of justification by faith. I'll say it this way also. Does the law say you can't be saved by simple faith? Is there anything in the Mosaic law that came 430 years after Abraham's promise that says Abraham's promise is now null and void? We're changing that. You can, man cannot be justified by simple faith. Is there anything in the law that changes salvation by faith and justification by faith? And the answer is no. That's not the purpose of the law. The law doesn't even speak to this topic. The other question he's asking, do any of the 613 laws in the Mosaic law offer salvation by working to keep the law? Is there anything in the 613 laws? Go back and read Exodus and Leviticus. Read what the law is and find something in the law that says, if you obey the law, you will be eternally saved and justified by God. You won't find it. The law doesn't have in it anything that says, believe in this or do this and be saved the way the New Testament does, speaking of faith in Jesus Christ. It's not the purpose of the law. It's mute on the subject of the salvation, the eternal salvation of men's souls. That's not what it's for. So Paul is asking these questions. Do any of the 613 laws in the Mosaic Law offer salvation by working? That would be a change from what God did with Abraham. Does the law change? Does the law conflict by the way Abraham was saved through faith alone? And the answer is no. The law doesn't say anything about salvation from hell or how to get saved. That's not what the law is for. That's not what the law is for. The Mosaic law regulated the lives of the Jews. The Mosaic law was given to regulate the lives of the Jews, but it did not provide eternal spiritual life for them. For them. It never claimed to. It regulated their spiritual lives. It regulated their worship life. It regulated their dietary life. It worshiped whom they marry. It regulated how they dealt with their children. It regulated all facets of their human life. But nothing in the law said, this is how you will be eternally saved. That's not what it was for. The Mosaic law regulated the lives of the Jews, but did not ever promise in any way, not even a shred of a promise to save a man's soul eternally. It doesn't say that in it. The problem in Israel is that people like the Pharisees and these Judaizers in Paul's day and in current day of Galatia were worshiping the law instead of worshiping Yahweh. And we have that tendency... 
we can worship the Bible in the same way that the Judaizers and the Pharisees worship the law. They worship the Mosaic law. They didn't worship the God of the Bible or they would have welcomed God's Son, Jesus Christ. Instead of constantly telling Jesus, you're a breaker of the law. You don't keep the Sabbath. You eat with tax collectors and drunkards. You do this, you do that. You're healing on the Sabbath. You're raising people from dead on the Sabbath. They were so bound up by the worship of the law that they missed the time of their visitation. God on earth walked among them and they missed Him because they worshiped the law. And these Judaizers that are coming into the Galatian churches are worshipers of the law. They're lifting up the law to be equal to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. You have to have faith in what He did for you and keep the law. Paul says, absolutely not. The law doesn't say a thing about this. And if you knew what the law says, you'd know it. So Judaism then, and is still today, Judaism has become a religion of human works. Judaism has become a religion of keeping the law, of human works for salvation. They rejected, Judaism rejects the grace of God, the free gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a works-based group just like so many others. In verse 23, as we continue, Paul continues explaining the purpose of the Mosaic Law. We're still in this section. Is the law contrary? Is it in opposition to the promise that a man can be saved by faith? Did the law come and say, no, things have changed? And a man is saved this way now. No, the law didn't. And we're still in that section. He continues to explain the purpose of the Mosaic Law. And what he's focusing on here is that the purpose of the law was to prepare the way for faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, he talks about it, it trapping us under sin. It made us understand our sinfulness because we couldn't, no Jew could keep the law. It made every Jew understand his guilt. He's guilty before God. He can't keep the law. He's a sinner in need of a Savior. That's what Paul is saying here. The preparation for the Lord Jesus Christ is what the law was for. He says in verse 23, but before faith came. And what he's talking about in faith here, don't misunderstand that that faith, salvation by faith came at a certain point. No, salvation by faith goes to the Garden of Eden. Salvation by faith goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. What he's talking about here when he mentions faith is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You could even interpret it as before Jesus Christ came. Uh, A a use of a Greek uh, metonymy, uh, we won't get into it. But the fact is he's saying before Messiah came, before, uh, before faith in this person, Jesus Christ came, before Jesus Christ came, what did the law do? We were kept in custody under the law. We were kept in custody under the law, being shut up again, trapped, imprisoned, until the faith which was later to be revealed came. That's what he's saying here. Before Jesus Christ came and salvation became personal, a belief not in a Redeemer that we don't know, not in a Deliverer that we don't know, Uh, not in a Messiah that we don't know, but when, when faith became personal in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the law was kept, uh, the law kept keeping us under custody until Jesus Christ came. So faith in Jesus Christ for salvation is what he's talking about. The point is that even though, listen to this, even in the Old Testament, faith was the only way to be saved. The the Old Testament, and a lot of people think this erroneously, a lot of people think in the Old Testament that a man was saved, a Jewish man, a Gentile in the Old Testament time, was saved by keeping the Mosaic Law. That's insane. And the reason it's insane is because in this same section in Galatians chapter 3, Paul says if you can't keep all of the law, you're guilty of all of the law. If you break even one of the 613 commands, and everybody does, then you're guilty of the entire law. 
The law never was intended to save. It cannot save. But it points us to the fact that we're sinners. So the point is that even in the Old Testament, faith was the only way to be saved. But when Jesus Christ came in the flesh, faith had a definite and a personal object, and that object's name was Jesus of Nazareth. The law kept us entrapped. It it says that it kept us in custody. It kept the Jew under the law, in the custody of the law. That word under the custody or kept in custody, it means imprisoned or confined. Or I like this definition, guarded against escape. Now you think, what would the law of Moses telling me that I'm a sinner, what is it that I could escape? What is it that the law had to wrap its arms around me and confine me to? It's this fact. The fact that you can't escape or you shouldn't escape the consciousness of your sin and your guilt before God as a sinner. You can't get outside and think, well, I'm not guilty. There's no God. The law taught about God. It taught about how to worship God. It was very, very specific. And it had 613 laws. And if you can't keep them all, you're guilty. And the law continuously entrapped Israel under guilt. Even Paul in Romans chapter 7 says, I wouldn't know what coveting was until I read in the law that what coveting was. And now I realize I'm a coveter. See what the law did? Paul reads the law. He says, Paul would not, never have known what it was to covet, to desire something that God hasn't given you, to desire your neighbor's possessions, even your neighbor's wife. Paul says, I wouldn't have known that, but I read it one day as a child. I read in the law, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And when I read the law, I realized guilty is charged. Maybe not the neighbor's wife will give him the benefit of the doubt, but coveting something. Wanting something that the Lord had not provided for him. That's what the law did for Paul. I wouldn't have known coveting unless the law had taught me that. And it proved, I proved myself to be a coveter guilty under the law. So what did the law continue to do? It kept men guilty of their sin. It reminded men that they had a guilt before God because they couldn't, they couldn't be perfect. And so they had a need for a Savior. They couldn't be perfect, and so they had a need for a Savior. Only a guilty man has a need to be forgiven. If you can't determine the fact that you're guilty, and that's the purpose of the law for Israel, if you can't determine the fact that you're guilty, you won't feel the need for a Savior. But the law was that great tool that God used to entrap all mankind to the fact that you cannot... Keep this law. You're sinners. You're guilty of sin. You're all in need of a Savior. All have sinned, according to the book of Romans, and fallen short of the glory of God. You're not perfect. And you have to be perfect in order to enter heaven. If you want to be justified and declared righteous, the only way is belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. It also says at the end of that, uh, that the the law kept us under custody until the faith which was later to be revealed came. There is a time coming when the law loses its effectiveness. And the law lost its effectiveness, according to Paul, when Jesus came to earth. When the faith came, that faith which was later to be revealed. It says in verse 24, Therefore, he talks about another statement about the law. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to Christ our tutor to lead us to Christ. To lead us, you'll see, is in italics. It's not in the Greek. The Greek just says, to lead, uh, or our, the law has become our tutor to Christ. But it's obvious that it means to lead us to Christ so that we would understand our need for a Savior so that we'd bow before the Lord and say, Lord, there's no way I can do what you've asked me to do in the law. There must be another way. And God says there is. Faith alone in the Redeemer. Faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. It says, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be, here's Paul's great line in the book of Galatians, in the book of Romans, so that we may be justified by faith, not by the works of the law, not by keeping the law. 
Jesus Christ was revealed at a point in time. The law went out. But what does it say about the law? Let's look at this just for a minute. It says it was our pedagogos. Pedagogos. It was our guardian, our tutor. The Greek word is pedagogos. P-A-I-D-A-G-O-G-O-S. Now, this word doesn't speak to us today. Uh, the Galatians would have naturally understood this much more than we did because they lived in Rome. And in Rome, they had pedagogues. They had tutors. And this is what this person did in the Roman time. It was a person appointed to watch over a young child. It was usually a well-educated slave. It wasn't another son. It wasn't your older brother. It was a non-family member, a Roman slave that was, uh, that was put under your charge or you were put under that person's charge, usually from about the age of six all the way to puberty. These people in Galatia, their children, if they'd have been under Roman custom, and they were, would have purely understood what a pedagogue was, what a tutor was. It's a person appointed to watch over a young child, to train his public behavior. These pedagogues were ruthless. They were oftentimes uh, cruel and harsh in their treatment of the, uh, of the child, the son of their master. And they were also to guard the childs from the evils of society. Now, while you're writing this, understand that Paul is saying this is what the law did. This is what the Mosaic law did for Jews until Jesus Christ came to earth. And all these unknown things came to be known that Jesus was the Messiah, that faith in Jesus, this particular person and his death, burial and resurrection is the way of salvation. This is what the law did for Israel. It guarded them. So the pedagogue, as these Galatians would understand, guarded the children from the evils of society, and the pedagogue, this tutor, also gave them moral training. This is what the law is. That's what the law did. It kept Israel away from evils. It kept Israel understanding, or it gave Israel the understanding of the moral uh, uh, the things that God expected from them morally. Thou shalt not steal, honor your father and your mother, etc., etc. This defines the law. It doesn't say anything about salvation, does it? That the law wasn't a salvific document. That's not why it was given. So in Roman tradition, and the Galatians lived in the Roman province of Galatia, they were in the Roman Empire, the Roman tradition was, as I've said, for an educated slave to take charge over one of his master's children and guide this children in all these things, train him in his behavior, keep him from the evils of society, keep him physically safe, give them moral training. But remember that I said it lasted from about age six to puberty. It was temporary. There was a time in which the pedagogue's job was finished in the life of a son. We're talking about young children here. When a son got to be an adult son, let's say, 13 years of age, according to the Jewish tradition of uh, Bar Mitzvah, the son of the law. When a son got to be of age, he became an adult son with all the rights and privileges of a son not a kid being trained by a tutor or a pedagogue. You see the difference? This kid had to be raised up. And then when the kid got to adulthood, the job of the tutor or the pedagogue was finished. So once the child grew up and became an adult son, here's another word. This Greek word is huios, H-U-I-O-S. That child became a son. No longer a kid waiting to gain the rights of the family. He became an adult son with rights and privileges in the household. When he was under the tutor, he did not have the rights and privileges of the household. He was not an adult son, not even an heir, until the pedagogue's job was finished. And once that pedagogue's job was finished, that boy became a huios, an adult son, in the Roman family. 
in the Gentile family. The Galatians would have understood all this perfectly. They would, I wouldn't have had to say a single word to them about this. When Paul said the law has become our tutor, they knew exactly what he meant. We have to take a few minutes to figure out what it means. They would have known exactly what he meant. These men were strict disciplinarians, as I also said, sometimes cruel and sometimes harsh. Uh, but notice again that it was a temporary, it was a temporary thing. The son would get out from under the tutor. The tutor was temporary. The law of Moses is temporary. This is genius what Paul is doing here. This is genius. Because a tutor is temporary, and everybody would have understood that. And when he brought in the law, they would have said, Ah, okay, we get it. The law is temporary. It had a purpose for a time. Its purpose has run its course. The faith has come. Jesus is on the earth. We believe in Jesus Christ. We don't need the law to condemn us as sinners. We, we have Jesus Christ who died for our sins. So this is what the Mosaic law did for Israel. Exactly what we've just said. It protected Israel from the evil around them. It demanded their obedience until Jesus Christ the Messiah came. That's what it was for. That's one of the purposes. That's the purpose that Paul is highlighting here. The Mosaic Law was temporary because it was only needed until Jesus Christ came to earth. It pointed out Israel's sinfulness, and it trapped them under sin, unable to escape. They were kept under custody. That means they were unable to escape from the judgment, the verdict, that you are guilty sinners. And then Jesus came, the Savior, to offer forgiveness of sins through His sacrifice on the cross. Once the Jews understood their sinfulness through the law, the way Paul did, I didn't know coveting until I read the law and then I knew that I was a coveter. Once the Jews understood their sinfulness because of that purpose of the law, then they understood their need for a Savior to save them from God's penalty. The law was genius, holy, righteous, and good. The law of Moses is perfect. It's not faulty in, uh, in its execution, or it's not faulty in its execution as it being written. It's a perfect document. It's just that men are imperfect and can't keep it. That's all. The document is perfect. The document is not overdrawn. It's not uh, melodramatic. The document is perfect. The 613 laws of the Mosaic law were perfect. I point you to a man who kept every one of the laws. That's Jesus of Nazareth. If the law was a silly thing, Jesus wouldn't have kept the law. He'd have come and condemned the law. But he said, I, did, I didn't come to condemn the law. I didn't come to condemn man. I came that men might be saved and to fulfill the law of Moses. The law was good. It was holy. It was righteous and it was good. Jesus fulfilled the law. He kept the entirety of the law. And thus he was qualified to be our Savior. He was the perfect keeper of the law. In our place, I might add. But once Jesus came, the need for the law ended. It was temporary, just like be a child being under a tutor is temporary. The law came to its end. The narrative changed. And the narrative became justification by God was through faith in Jesus Christ. We have an object now. We have a person. We have the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Son of God who's come to earth. Salvation became personal. Personal in the object of our salvation. Not this person, this event, this... Uh, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. What else did Job know? Not much. But he knew that one day he would be redeemed. Until Jesus Christ came, even His followers, even the disciples, even the men that are writing the Scriptures didn't know who this man was until... I mean, in terms of His, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, his job as the Lamb of God. Until Jesus was resurrected, they didn't understand. They thought He'd been murdered by the Romans and by the Jews. 
But when they saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, they went back into the Scriptures. Even it says in Luke chapter 24 that Jesus, going, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, taught them everything that the law said about Him. You read that in the Gospels until, or, or yes, in the Gospels, that until the resurrection, even the men that were closest to Jesus thought it was, it was the greatest tragedy that had ever happened on earth that Jesus died on the cross. They didn't understand that that was the moment of salvation until they, after the resurrection and Jesus started filling them in on the truth of what the Old Testament really taught would have been a hard time to understand these things. These things are deep. That a man would come and die for the sins of the world uh, wasn't understood until the resurrection of Christ. So it became personal. Believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lamb of God, the God-man, and be saved from the penalty of your sins. Be justified by God became very, very personal. So Paul is saying here, the law had its purpose, the law had its day. And when Jesus came, it was finished. Look at what it says in verse 25. But now that faith has come, personal faith in a man, a God-man, Jesus Christ, we're no longer under a tutor. You can't make that any more clear. The law is the tutor. We're no longer under a tutor. I ask you, church-age Christians, are we under the Mosaic law? Not according to the Scriptures. The tutor is temporary, the law is temporary, the law was a tutor, and we are no longer under a tutor. We're not under the Mosaic law. We're under the, uh, the law of Christ, the law of love, and the commands of the New Testament. We're not under the Mosaic law. The things that we, are, that we have to do, that we must obey before the Father, begin in Acts chapter 2. That's when the church started. We're not under the law. Jesus Christ lived in the age of Israel. Not until Jesus' resurrection, 50 days later, the day of Pentecost, did the church begin. Our laws, our commands begin in Acts chapter 2 and go forward until I'd say Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 6 begins the tribulation, which goes back into the age of Israel. But Paul says, now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Jesus Christ, He was the promised deliverer. He was the one that Job had in mind, although Job didn't know it when he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. That Redeemer has a name now. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And so a believer, I mean, the promised Savior Jesus has come to earth. He's died for the sins of mankind so that we know who to believe in. Not just this deliverer, not the seed of the woman, not the seed of Abraham. Now we know who he is. We know who to place our faith in. We no longer need a tutor. We no longer need the law. The law as our tutor no longer needs to teach us about our sinfulness. Faith in Jesus Christ, the person, the God-man, is the only focus in salvation now. Yes, men have to understand that they're sinners. But in the Old Testament to the Jewish nation, God did this through the institution of the Mosaic Law. It bound Israel under sin. It trapped them with no way of escaping the fact that they're sinners in need of a Savior. It pointed them to the faith, Jesus Christ, who would come to earth one day, and as Paul is writing, has come to earth. Look what he says in verse 26. Now look at this word on the board. I tell you, Paul, just a, a wordsmith, masterful. Remember who the tutor, the pedagogue came to the young son. The young son between the ages of approximately six all the way until puberty. The young son was under a tutor. There are other words in the Greek for son. Um, paideia is another word for son. Uh, brephos is another word for son. But huios speaks of an adult son with the rights and privileges in the household. And so what Paul is doing here is saying that you were once children kept by the faith. But look what he changes to in verse 26. 
He says, now, now that the law has ended its, its course, its purpose, now that Jesus Christ, the faith in Jesus Christ has come, now that we know that justification is by simple faith in Jesus Christ alone, you're no longer children under a tutor. Now you are all sons of God. Guess what the word sons is in verse 26? Huios. You're no longer children kept under a tutor. You're adult sons of Jesus Christ, adopted into the family of Christ, heirs with Jesus Christ. Simply by, by simple belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're all, he tells the Galatians, while the Judaizers in Galatia, go back to what's going on. He's taught them this before. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I'm going to tell you all about Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to tell you how he lived, what he did, the miracles that he did. I'm going to prove to you from the Old Testament that he is the promised Messiah. And I'm going to tell you about his death and resurrection. He did all that in Galatia and they believed and they were saved. And now this other group is coming in and saying, well, that's not how you get saved. And Paul is saying, no, it is in fact how you get saved. It's not about the law. The law is a tutor. The law is temporary. The law is finished. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul tells the Galatians who are tormented of soul by false teachers, am I really saved? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Am I really saved? How can I know I'm saved? Should there be a change in me? Should I see something? Paul says, friends, you were saved by faith and you are right now and eternally adult sons of God. And they're trying to entrap you in childhood again. If you want to be under the law, then you are a child under a tutor. You're not a child under a tutor. You are an adult son with all the rights and privileges of being in the family of God. Live like it. And by the time we get into Galatians chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6, he is screaming out, live like it. He's laying down the groundwork here. He's settling their souls because their souls have been unsettled by people who have come into their churches and are preaching, are, are preaching garbage. Paul is settling the souls of the congregation. You are all adult sons through faith in Christ Jesus. It can't get any more clear than that. You weren't sons before. You were sons of disobedience. You were lost in your trespasses and your sins. But now that you have believed, now that you have placed your faith in Christ Jesus, you are adult sons. Why would you ever go back to the law and childhood? You get it? That's what he's saying. The law was childhood for Jewish men, Jewish people. We're not children anymore. We're adult sons through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're at peace with God according to Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Paul would tell the Romans, we are at peace with God through faith in Christ Jesus. And these people's souls, he tells them earlier, don't let anyone come in here and stir your minds up with this garbage. Your adult sons your adult sons, your adult sons through faith in Christ Jesus. Simple faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing else. You Galatians are adult sons and these Judaizers, these false teachers, Satan's men on the, on the street are trying to force you back into childhood. What adult child would want to become a, a baby again? You have the rights and privileges of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. You are royal family of God now. You want to go back to being a child. You're all sons through faith in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 27, For all of you... Paul knows this entire church... Paul knows these people intimately. I can imagine in the days that Paul was in Galatia going through these churches and Lystra and Derbe and Antioch, Iconium. I can imagine Paul had many, many living room conversations 
Many, many intimate conversations with these people, leading them, showing them, teaching them the understanding of who Jesus was, what the penalty of sin is, and how it is that Jesus' substitutionary blood sacrifice satisfied the Father. You're sons now because you've believed in Jesus. And then he says, all of you, I know you, church, all of you, are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. See, this is another interesting thing. You don't see it here, but in the Roman tradition, if I say the word toga, do you know what I mean? The adult son. Part of the ceremony of the adult son coming out from under the the tutelage of a tutor and a pedagogue, part of the ceremony of the adult Roman son was that he was clothed in a toga with a wreath on his head and a toga on his body. Paul, continuing the analogy here, speaks of the fact that under a tutor, when that was finished, this adult son was clothed with a toga to show his adulthood in Roman society. And you all, in a spiritual sense, you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Jesus Christ clothes every one of you Galatians. You have, listen, you have already been justified. The righteousness that you seek, that the Judaizers are saying only comes through keeping the law, has already been yours. You've already been declared righteous by God. He's already deemed you adult sons when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. And He has clothed you the way the Romans did with the toga. The Father has clothed you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are righteous. You are justified. You are adult sons because of your belief in Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, Paul was hot. You foolish Galatians, he starts this with. And now he's reaching into their souls and saying, Come on, you know these things. Don't let anybody by letter, by spirit, don't let anybody in here come in here and stir up your souls. You are saved. And my gosh, you see this everywhere in churches today. You just see unsettled souls. Am I this? Am I that? Am I saved? Am I living the Christian life right? It's just a mess. It frustrates me so much that we are stirring up people's souls. You're sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Take a deep breath, you eternal child of God. Don't let these fools, these satanic envoys, come into your church and stir the church. You were all baptized into Christ, and we'll pick up that next time and maybe even finish the chapter next time.